The following is a presentation of the Control Trends Podcasting Network. Hi, welcome to Control Talk Now, your smart buildings video cast and podcast for the week ending September 29th, 2019. This is episode 333, where we talk about all things smart controls and introducing your co-host to mine this week is my wife, Anna. So introduce the man, the myth, the legend. The man, the myth, the legend, Kenny Smyers. No, nah, you've got to do better than that. Say <laughs> welcome your co-host and mine. Welcome your host and mine. Your co-host and mine. Your co-host and mine. The man. The man, the myth, the legend. The one, the only secret agent. The one, agent the man. only secret agent man. <laughs> Kenny Smyers. Okay, there you go. Thanks, babe. You yeah, passed right. Hi, <laughs> right, brother. Well, man, there we go, man. We're kicking off another week on Control Trends. Well, that's hard. That's hard to talk. That's yeah. hard to top, Eric. I yeah, mean, I'm, so I'm, I'm uh, my heels out again. It's going to be a contract now that she has to introduce you from now on, right? Is that the deal? Well, I certainly don't mind that. <laughs> so I, I can't can't say anything without getting in trouble here other than say that was a very, very special introduction. And I it was a very it. special and, uh, She did a fabulous job. Anna did a fabulous job. She did. So she passed and, off. Uh, I'm glad to hear I think we'll keep her. So she certainly did. Go. All right, brother. Hey, man. Well, All righty. Uh, we got a lot going on this week. We got an incredible guest teed up, and this is this is somebody you're gonna want to hear. It's you know, I think you described this technology, Kenny, as sort of like the atom bomb of our industry. It, it could change everything. So you're gonna want to hear our guest this week and hear what he has to say and see what he has to show us. But before we get to that, buddy, we got a couple of things going on on control trends. Yeah, Eric, the, uh, the week itself was just one of those weeks that escaped. The, the, um, there was a lot going on. We'll be doing some catch-up work. Um, you know, we, we talked uh, you know, pretty much uh, you know, through, the, through the course of the week. We were in a training mode. We, you guys had some training going on down uh, at your location. I saw the KMC training going on. So this has been a week of move, movement around and, 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 and innovation and, and, and you know, just incredible amounts of innovation technology are available. How we're going to get that from the vendors to the, to the market is, is hard work. You got you to get out there and you got to, you know, a lot of feet on the street. You got to have people come in classrooms and whatever, because the dissemination uh, is important. And then there's just, again, I, we, we were fortunate. We worked uh, through uh, Western Pennsylvania with Siemens uh, this week and, and uh, met some group. Bill Coyle did a great job. We had uh, Brent in from uh, Siemens and, they, and both of these guys are con con consummate press, uh, professionals in the fact that they're, they, they brief engineers, they brief uh, ASHRAE, you know, they meet with ASHRAE folks or on different committees and whatever. And then uh, we brought it to the trade schools too. So we're up at 449. And, and it was really cool because uh, we're seeing the clarification within our industry. We went through some interesting things with the, the valving that we saw from uh, originally Belimo and Johnson has their version of pick V and Siemens certainly has a, a very good version, but we did some clarifications on, on mechanical variants and electronic variants, you know, where you can use sensors uh, out there in different points of and return and, and pressure, and then you can have it happen within the valve itself uh, and, and what the benefits are of each. Uh, the revision of uh, HVAC, uh, Division 23, you know, and the Lighting 26, and the Shades, uh, Division 12, uh, all are coupling and coming together in this Division 25 so that you get the master systems integrated, or you get the integration. Uh, we see a lot of people, uh, you know, these, these – um, People that are doing this day in the feet on the street people, the actual installers, the actual trades people, the actual uh, you know contractors are on their own, uh, and the remarkable choices they have and how important their role is, is evolving. Eric, these are the people, these are the technicians. These guys have face to face contact with the users and the people that are making decisions. And it used to be uh, we heard that inverted sale thing where it used to be you know trickle down top of the triangle, millions of dollars in the companies, and how you went through the top hierarchy. Uh, and then the guy at the bottom who winds up doing all the work says, this isn't going to work. There's, there's mistakes being made here all along. And then all we're doing around is driving. And then we're going to hear this from uh, our, our speaker or our interview coming up that the, the way we're doing things may need to be adjusted. Yeah, very, very cool. Well, for our audience that might not know, Kenny, let's talk about shade control because that's something in the U.S. anyway is a relatively new thing. Talk about why that's important and, and sort of, uh, you know, it's being integrated now into control specs. Well, you know, uh, there's been some fabulous engineering done. Uh, you know, if you break things down, you break them down into zones, rooms, and and the building. And the building is basically an envelope, uh, you know, constructed uh, above Earth. You know, and it's subjected to the rise and fall of you know sun. So the way I, the most recent model I saw was so incredible, is that a building is affected through the course of 24 hours. You know, 
consistently so that you can get really good at uh, knowing sunrise, sunset, and how the building goes through different periods where this side is getting sun, it's getting warmer, this side's still in, in the shade, it needs to, you know, it needs to heat, and how you mitigate those things for optimal energy spends, right? But within the zone itself, within the room itself, the automation that can bring the HVAC at its highest uh, efficiency optimization with the lighting, which could be from your ceiling lights, LEDs, you know, from the, the light you're getting from the outside. Uh, and all these things come to bear on uh, if you get too much heat gain, you can cause the air conditioning to come on. So, or if you have, uh, if there's light enough outside, you don't need your lights here, which is the best to create those optimalities. And it's not just energy efficiency, it's comfort, it's user satisfaction. It's schools that have eight different, Lighting uh, requirements, scenarios now. Where in the morning, the lights should be this. Uh, in the afternoon, after lunch, they should be this. At the end of the school day, people were getting a little bit, the, the students could get tired or, or whatever. Or office workers could get tired. You know, after, after they eat lunch, you come back at 2 o'clock, all of a sudden, they feel tired. You know, and it could be a condition that could be corrected because it could be an ambient condition that we're finally getting the metrics to understand what that could mean, why that's happening, you know, and how to correct it. You know, so the tremendous uh, things that are being going on at MIT and Harvard, you know, but, but human uh, physiology and, and how it functions, the business cases that we're learning from the different uh, vendors on, uh, you know, that you could definitely um, improve the uh, efficiencies, the energy efficiency, and also the occupancy experience. But now you're getting the uh, actual uh, equipment. So start in Europe out of efficiency, I would say. And as, as, as a, probably an intended consequence was greater comfort control uh, and greater, you know, just more pleasant environment. But now it's coming to North America. And there were a couple of leaders on, you know, that Acuity's uh, purchasing of Distech, you know, that was really launched the whole thing, at least in my, my world, uh, in my understanding. And then, you know, uh, you had Siemens's total room automation, uh, which really packaged it in one control. You had the ability to do a total uh, control of that zone, you know, and we saw how you know, when you make this talk, the semantics, the taxonomy of explaining stuff, first you start with the, making a smart zone or smart or a unified or integrated zone, then building, and then you, you go all the way up to that smart city thing. But uh, my knowledge came, I lived in Germany nine years and, and I was in the Air Force at the time where I first experienced what was called Rouladen. And those were uh, a very heavy wooden slatted type line that when you put it down, it totally shut out the room. So and I used to work swings and mids, I'd come home and I never had to worry about lighting, you know, affecting my sleep. And then that, that, that the rise and fall of these, uh, or bringing these, uh, blinds or these shades up and down was automated so you had these little motors up in the side and and, and and so my sister still lives in germany when i go to her house uh, they have it all set on automation so i mean they, they these houses are in europe are so efficient but at 6 30 mm -hmm. the the shades go up well, and, make, you know, it makes a lot of sense because again you know we've all had the experience of being in a room and the sun's beating in and it creates extra heat load right but if you automatically sure. have the shades go down and speaking of siemens kenny i mean you know, remember two shows ago we 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 had uh the folks from siemens on and they had the cool rdy thermostat and you know we sort of had a a thing that you know send in your person that your celebrity that should get this thermostat and Kenny and I'll endeavor to get it to that person. And they had a lot of participation in that, but the winner looks like Eric, it was actually the RDS 120 B RDS 120 B. Gotcha. 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 Well, we got, we got two of those that we're going to be sending to based on our control trends community, Will Smith. So we'll endeavor to get it to Will Smith, the cool guy. He's a cool guy and his wife, Jada Pickett Smith. So, uh, and we're going to say, uh, you know, a love letter from, the control trends community. So who knows that might show up in a movie someplace, but man, talking about great technology, Kenny, let's not keep the audience waiting any longer. Chris Myers, a teacher of mine once said, better is always different, but different is not always better. And we are so excited. We're going to introduce our community to a technology, a new approach. I can't even call it building automation controls, although building automation controls are part of it, but this is going to be a session. You're going to listen to the whole Thing. So, Kenny, introduce our guest and let's get started. I'd love to, Eric. I'm truly excited because uh, the, the prep work we did here for this uh, is just amazing. This is a new innovation, new technology, and it's really exciting. It's dynamic. We are pleased to bring Troy Harvey, CEO of Passive Logic, to Control Trends. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Troy. guys. 
Yeah. Right. Now, Welcome. I'm happy to be here and I, I love hearing your guys' discussion. So it's fun to be on, on your show. Oh, well, fantastic. Fantastic. Well, listen, Troy, I think the first thing we had to sort of set a context is yeah. if you read your resume, your LinkedIn yeah. profile, it is amazing what you've done. I mean, you've done everything from engineering to software. I mean, how about walking us through as a start sort of your background and sort of lead it up to Passive Logic and what had you start Passive Logic, if you would? Yeah. So, I started in the electrical engineering product development space, and I spent a lot of time in my early career designing products for all kinds of customers. You know, IBM research laboratories and small inventors and, and, and you know, big marketing firms and whatnot. But in the early 2000s, at the initial like early days of the green building movement, I found myself doing building simulation work. Now, building simulation is really interesting because up until that time, architects would design a building and they build it right and and when you think about it from say like an engineering perspective that's kind of a crazy idea you design it and you do this one-off experiment and you build it without any beta testing and so we started doing this building simulation work where we would enable architects to come and work with us on their ideas and we digitally beta test this in this virtual world hundreds of different times try different glazings and and, and materials and, and whatnot and, and then start working through the mechanical systems of how you would control this and how you would make those mechanical systems, you know, get the best outcome for the building. During this process, we started getting involved in the rest of the building systems. You know, how do we do mechanicals better? How do we do controls better? And like a lot of people in this space, what we found is that, you know, buildings would be designed really well. They'd be architected really well. They'd be controlled by really competent controls teams. Uh, but then they kind of fall down when they got onto the ground. And we saw this happening throughout the whole industry. And then later you saw that the rest of the lead industry, like, you know, the lead gold platinum buildings, people started catching on. They're like, hey, our buildings aren't actually living up to their engineering. So we took a step back and we said, okay, what's going on here? And we realized there were some fundamental flaws, some fundamental computer science theories that we could apply to building automation for why things were falling down on, in, on the ground. And there, it came down to a couple different problems that we saw. And so we said, okay, how, how do we go about this differently? How, how can we take everything we know about computer science theory and apply it to buildings? Right about that same time, my firm was hired by my co-founder, Jeremy. Now, Jeremy comes from the deep tech industry. He was uh, one of the founding engineers of a company called Fusion IO. And in your phone and in your devices, you have flash storage these days. Well, Fusion IO invented the whole concept of high performance flash using this real commodity flash chips, but doing it in a way that you could actually store things and, and over and over and over without ruining your flash. And they had this really nice multi-billion dollar IPO. He was building this cool house on the hill and he was saying like, how am I gonna control this thing? So he hired my firm, this house of glass, and we started talking about the state of automation. And he said, wow, I've been looking at this stuff and it's really kind of terrible. Like, and I said, yeah, let me tell you about it. And so he came on as an angel investor and then within a couple of months, he's like, wow, this is just like so much more exciting than watching Fusion IO float into the distance. Let me come on as a co-founder. And we, we started Passologic about four years ago. Well, that's really cool. Uh, uh, this is this is exciting. Uh, it reminds me of Silicon Valley show. I, I, I love that series, and 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 because uh, you know a lot of stuff happens like that, and it really does in real life. But um, my first curious, uh, how did you come up with the name Passive Logic? I mean, it's two incredible yeah. uh, you know directions, or, and how did they come together? Yeah. So we were thinking about the naming of Passive Logic, and and the two things that came to mind was first, what buildings require of the user today is. Uh, this sort of activity, they're always bugging us for more and more and interactivity of making it work, whether it's on the thermostatic level or as you get smarter and smarter buildings, what we're finding is those smarter and smarter buildings are actually requiring more of the user, not less of the user. And we start thinking about that the logic of buildings, the automation of buildings should be like an assistant, right? It should just take care of things and you shouldn't have to worry about it unless you are geeky enough to want to look at it. And so we were looking at, you know, hey, how can we as sort of the backseat user of the, the automation, sit in the backseat while the car drives us, right? How can buildings just take care of things and we can just be a passive participant and, but still have the buildings work for us, work on our behalf. 
Very, very cool. Well, listen, uh, Troy, I got to ask, I mean, when we sort of talked before the show a little bit, uh, you were pretty adamant about the fact that passive logic isn't a BMS system, building management system. Uh, it's more of an autonomous building platform. Uh, tell us about that and, and the distinctions and what our audience needs to know about that. Yeah, so as we stepped back from you know, the problems that we were seeing on the ground. We said, you know, what the buildings really need? And you can look at what's happening in technology, not just in the building space, but in all of these verticals. And we are looking at systems technology and we're saying, well, the end point of systems technology is autonomous systems. And that's true for buildings. And when we look at the marketplace, and this is, I think, what's sort of underrated about the buildings market is we are the single largest controlled systems market in the world, right? By, by dollars, by square footage, by whatever metric you want to apply, buildings are the biggest controlled systems. And if the endpoint is autonomous systems, well, what does that mean? What does that mean for everybody in the building marketplace from architects, engineers, to us in the automation business, to the occupants that live in our buildings, to the guys who do the maintenance and management, the ESCOs that come in to try to make buildings better, to the utilities that we're gonna interact with. And then further, when we start looking at the implications of autonomous buildings, we need to then start stepping back and say, well, what are the implications for these smart cities that everybody talks about? Well, you can't have smart cities unless you have smart buildings. And today we don't have smart buildings yet. And autonomous building technology enables that. So there's all these sort of ripples throughout the industry of how we work together and the implications of when we do an automation system, what does that mean for everybody else in the building value chain? That makes a lot of sense. And, and so it's, it's almost like you're redefining a smart building. In other words, it sounds like part of your uh, maybe mission statement or vision is if you have to put a lot of energy into it to make it smart, it's not really smart. It should just be autonomous. And like you said earlier, passive logic, the passive uh, aspect of it, you should be able to have it set up once and then just do what it needs to do to, to operate. I mean, that makes a lot of sense being smart. In my yeah, that, you have there's, these two things. There's, oh, some to, there's some work to get there, though. I mean, I, I love the, 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 the thing, but uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, but uh, I, I just wanted to, uh, I'm, tr I'm trying to follow this as though our viewers do. Uh, it's great what we're doing, but the steps to get there, and we're going to talk about those. But I mean, uh, we're saying that it should just lay on something and, and do it aut autonomous. A bit, but to get it, like you have some standards and ste steps to take in order to make this feasible. In other words, it's not magic. Well, right, no, it's not. It's not magic. But but you but you do use artificial intelligence as part of it, right? Machine learning, artificial intelligence. So that is kind of magic in my world. Right? <laughs> yeah. Well, two two things here. Uh, First, I'd say the most important parts aren't the artificial intelligence that help you do the controls. Most important parts, and we'll talk about this in more detail, are this underlying deep digital twin technology. Because without that, you can't apply any amount of artificial intelligence to solve the control problems we have today. But I think we have this balance right now, right, in the industry. When you look at autonomous buildings and smart cities and the whole implications for the building industry, the thing that we see most of the industry not really coming to grips with is there's one reality. There's the guy on the ground who's probably an automation installer who's the only guy who's actually putting stuff into buildings. So if you don't address how you package this up into the thing that we need to get all the things that we want, then you're not really going to be successful applying all these new wants for the whole value chain into buildings. Okay, so Troy, I, I just, I gotta be the first to say, you look like a super nice guy. You know, you look like the type of guy we're gonna sit down and have a beer with, but you know, you sound pretty disruptive here. What you're talking about seems like it could be very disruptive to, uh, you know, how people are doing building automation controls now. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a fair statement. What we see when we talk to the different players in the market, you know, they've really never seen anything like Passive Logic, and that's on purpose because when we started this business we said well there's some fundamental flaws in the way we're doing automation relative to what we're being asked to do in buildings right we just can't apply the same technology to get the outcomes that everybody's asking of us and we told our guys throw away everything you know about automation put it in the garbage and let's start from scratch mm -hmm. because if we don't do that we can never get to where we want to go so new standards it sounds like new standards and and that's the nature of that article that you were discussing and you know we can put up a visual if you'd like to talk about that what yeah. we're thinking in terms of automation yeah. yeah can we do that let's do that for sure okay so 
what we realized in this marketplace was we're all starting to talk about smarter buildings, right? And this kind of nomenclature evolves out of the smartphone and smart home and this notion of smart. Well, what does smart mean? And this is the fundamental problem we find in industry as everybody's talking together. People mean different things in terms of what smart is. And when we're looking down the path of, you know, the end point of all of this intelligence is fully autonomous buildings. We said, well, gosh, you know, somebody solved this problem and the Automotive Engineers Association got together and they said, hey, let's come up with some nomenclature. And they came up with this level one or level zero through level five. So it turns out when you compare autonomous buildings to autonomous vehicles, they're more the same than they are different. People might struggle with this idea initially, but think about it for a second, that a vehicle navigates through a two-dimensional map from point A to point B in the most efficient way possible without crashing anything along the way. And buildings, it turns out, while we don't move in space, we move in time and it's the exact same problem. We have to navigate from point A to point B in time, only it's actually a little bit more sophisticated in buildings, right? We're not navigating just one vehicle through this two-dimensional map. We're navigating a whole fleet of subsystems, heating and cooling, ventilation, lighting systems, energy systems, and occupancy systems. And it's not just in two dimensions, it's in multiple dimensions. As we go forward through time, we're looking at all these on-ramps and off-ramps of control decisions we could make, but it's all interactive between all of these systems in the whole building. So when we look at that comparison today, most buildings are what we call level zero. This is manual control, this is thermostatics, it's the exact same thing as cruise control. You set your car to 60 miles an hour and it cruises along at 60 miles an hour. In buildings, we do the same thing, we set it to 72 degrees, and again, the building just maintains that 72 degrees. This is 99% of the industry today. What we see as the edge of the building industry today is what we would call level one. This is adaptive set points. It's the same thing as adaptive cruise control if you've ever been in this kind of car, you know it's like driving at 60 miles an hour, comes behind a slow car, slows down, that car gets out of the way, it speeds up. Now, here's the thing about adaptive cruise control, is most people that you talk to would say, it's just smart enough to be annoying, not smart enough to be useful. And we think that in the buildings world, we're you know maybe a little better off than that with some of these adaptive systems where you say, well, I'm gonna take this cloud-based AI and have it poke at my thermostatics or adjust my PIDs and do this adaptivity of the same exact infrastructure I've always had. Now, you know, and by always, we mean this stuff is largely 100 years old or older. PID came from the 1930s and thermostatics came from the 1800s. And trying to poke at it with AI only gets us a very small distance down the path. So when we look at, you know, what is that path look like to get to the next uh, step? Well, there's this gap from taking conventional controls and automating them a little bit, you know, automating our automation with a little AI, and how do we get to level two, three, four, five, and beyond? And you're not gonna be able to do that with the conventional infrastructure. And what we saw in the buildings market, which is really interesting compared to the car market, is that there's not just this cap at level five because cars drive off the, the uh, factory floor completely done, but we're still building them out in the field. We're still manufacturing a building in the field. And so there's these interesting opportunities we have that automobiles don't have to take that same intelligence, apply it not just to real-time control, but apply it to how do we install building automation systems and how do we make those automation systems interactive, not just with right. people, themselves right so level six seven eight makes it makes it all affordable because your cost to install and commission goes personally. that's right Is yeah it? it's like what? now i've got this insight in the automation system how do i bring that insight to bear to make our job as installers easier better more pain-free now are you guys already there with that uh, uh we are so we're currently in um pilot uh testing. Um, so we have about 800,000 hours of cumulative time on our infrastructure uh, with, a, with a couple dozen uh, projects, a couple dozen buildings, right. of all kinds of topologies. Well, I, I know you talked to my engineering team at Stromquist and Company, 
And uh, they were saying, if I understood correctly, that it's almost to the point that you could go into a building and you could have uh, one manufacturer over here's parts, another manufacturer's here, and another manufacturer's here, and then your system will go out, find them, discover them, know what they were, and, and sort of uh, hook them up so they communicated. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, so our goal as a company was we saw all of this you know, sort of exploding sensor tech uh, and IoT and controllables happening in buildings, right? More and more and more. And what we realized is like, you can come up with as many smart sensors or IoT devices as you want, but the thing that's really missing in buildings is that organizational intelligence that brings it all together under one umbrella so that it's all gonna work together. You know, and it seems like one of the things, I remember uh, I spent some time studying with an Edwards Deming uh, disciple who was, you know, about quality, right? And one of the definitions of quality, at least from Deming's perspective, is you eliminate variance, right? So you get predictability. And it seems like one of the wild cards, the way things are done now is, you know, one installer might install a program differently than another installer. So it seems like, if I'm understanding this correctly, level six, seven, and eight in your process is going to really up the level of quality and, and de, you know, reduce the variance between from one installer to another. Is that a fair statement? That, that, I think that's a fair statement. The other thing that we see as an industry, um, I, I think most people experience this today, is that there's far more opportunity for automation than there is expertise in the field to execute. Well right? and, and this is... Uh, you know, I think oh, I see this on a bunch of levels. What I find com somewhat fascinating, I just spent about a month uh, traveling and, and meeting with different players in the building industry. And what I'd say in the automation industry, it's very typical when I go into a firm that the uh, you know guys that are driving the ship are in their 60s and the guys that are the heads are in their 50s and the youngest guy in the, in, in the firm might be in his 40s. And then there's this question of like, well, where are all the 20 and 30 year olds, right? And our our industry Good grief, yeah. and I think there's this problem right these guys have grown up in this you know world here that they just can't even relate to the technology we're dealing with because largely while we all have 2019 in our pocket we're going to work every day and still working in like 1985 yeah and these guys didn't even grow up <laughs> you know this is well before their day right and I had a guy a week ago is telling me, I went through one of the major manufacturers training classes. And he's like, it was such a cognitive dissidence of his reality compared to the reality of the automation industry. And I think what we're seeing is if you got those skills today, you're probably not working in automation. You're probably going to work for Google or Apple or Facebook. And there's an underlying happiness quotient there that I think that part of the challenge we see in our industry is that there's what we're being asked to do is fundamentally not possible with the technology we have, which leads to a lot of dissatisfaction. And you're constantly, as an automation engineer, being kind of yelled at and told how you did it wrong. Uh, and you could go to Apple and make an app and everybody's going to high five you. So we have this problem. We, we need to, to realign the industry and make it so that, hey, every day I go to work, I'm working with the world's coolest technology. And that makes sense because it's the world's biggest control space. The, the post uh, last control talk now regarding uh, you know getting the this young guns into the industry getting this talent in there and, and you're hitting the nails ahead I, I wish uh, i hope everybody listens to this interview because i think you, you hit several nails on the head about the 2019 being in your pocket and yet we're going to a 1995 environment telling everybody this is cool right you guys gonna be happy here you know and you're saying hey this i can't stand this place i don't see enough there's not enough light in here <laughs> i can't breathe this thing this old stuff is the equipment is is half of it's dead you just have it here laying here because it's filling up space and, and you want to look like you got things together but really it's, when it comes to technology and innovation it's, it's absent so, so I, th I really dig that uh, i like that the analogy of the app you're high-fiving because you're working on a discovery an adventure you're coming to work excited to see if you can get things through the, you know the system now or get, you know, get them into execute them and bring them into a commercial reality where before you're sustaining a problem where you're a bad guy you walk in the day and the best you're going to do is 70 percent well you know you, can't, you, can't, you don't get to yeah yeah no you know you're right you're right about that but the other thing i'm hearing and you know uh roy just so you know we've been tracking for a while uh you know the lack of talent and that gap keeps getting getting wide and we just don't have enough people to do what needs to get done and and so you know we've we've talked ad nauseum about how to solve that problem and one of the solutions is obviously how do we attract more people into the industry 
but it seems like what you're affording our community is okay well if you can't attract them you probably don't need you're not going to need them if you use our technology so you know it seems like you are uh, you know you're eliminating the dependence on again super talented individuals which there are lack of in our industry yeah well i think it's two-sided uh you know one of the things we talk a lot about in the uh artificial intelligence industry is specifically in the vehicle space that artificial intelligence in some industries will you know vastly reduce uh, labor and employment and, and in the vehicle space this is very concerning because uh, truck drivers are the number one job in America and effectively the technology is there to put these guys out of business out of work and that's a that's a concern and in the AI industry we think about like well how do we impact industries but what's really interesting here and I think the really unique opportunity we afford in the automation space is that last mile that last you know three steps is all on the ground it's going to take labor and we have plenty of labor in the marketplace we have hvac in uh, technicians and installers and we have automation technicians that are all capable but how do we democratize automation to get it to a wider audience and not just a wider number of users because the installers, the these HVAC companies and the automation companies that are fundamentally the customers, right? It's not usually the end building owner. How do we get into more people's hands? And then how do we get into more buildings, right? How do we make it that's cost effective to get into a thousand square foot building as much as a million square foot building? So I think we have a really interesting opportunity to democratize technology and get it, you know, into broader market, broader hands, broader users. Well, I, I, um, this is great stuff. It really is. Uh, it's enlightening. Uh, it's exciting. And I think you're offering, uh, you know, the, when something uh, happens and it's disruptive, it's not necessarily bad. It means that you're going to have to change. You might, uh, right. the last three steps, uh, I'm going to use that again. Hope you don't mind, but I really like that because that means there is a place for people. But, you know, getting down to the, the basics and then one of your articles that you published in uh, Automated Buildings uh, September about establishing a smart building industry standard, you talked about the lexicon. You talk about things down to the base level of language, the words we use. We do not have a lexicon to describe describe a smart building, how smart is smart, uh, you know, navigating, uh, you know, is, is the disbelief that people have about technology and how, how it can be put into effect very rapidly and, and very affordably. And then, of course, when you're done with all that, then you finally get to the common grounds. You can start talking about, you know, now, now that they understand it. So how do we uh, enlighten uh, our, our own industry, HVAC and building automation, but also uh, the, the users uh, you know the big the big guys well cb richard i think is there J jones lang and sal you know they've, they're, they're kind of there but the vast market the 80 percent of uh, the buildings in the united states have very little uh, you know automation of what we're, what past passive logic offers how do we how do we close that gap so i mean your question is really important um what we're seeing and and i think somewhat to our surprise because as a as a, a new technology company what you we really look for is those hurdles right in the industry where you're like hey there's these big hundred year old players that we're gonna have to jump over their hurdles but we see a bunch of things you know so in literally last week i had a meeting with a uh a, a group of the mechanical contractors association uh guys in chicago i met with some big gen general contractors from japan and i met with a group of one of the largest architectural firms, their, their architects, as well as giving a lecture at MIT about autonomous building systems. So this whole range, right, of different people with different views on the industry. And what we see in general is a level of excitement that what we're doing is bringing people's more consumer life experience to buildings, uh, as opposed to this idea that we're jumping too fast too far above what they experience with their current automation platforms and i think this has to do with the level of pain in the industry right fundamentally at the end of the day every automation project is painful there's a whole host of things that go wrong we try our best to accommodate all the desires of the engineer and the architects uh, and the owners of these buildings and the occupants but when you turn the switch on we're the guys who are the last out of the building, right? So we get blamed for everything. And then 
We get called a week later saying it's not right. We roll a truck, we tweak and we tune, and we do this at infinitum, right? Where we're just going around in a circle between the customer complaining and us tweaking and tuning. And, and the fundamental problem is the technology, the tools we're using are creating this level of dissatisfaction, right? That we are just not capable of meeting the demands of industry. And so I think most people are like, hey, yeah, I've experienced this. This is every project to some degree. How do we make it better, right? And I think we're at that moment in, in technology and time. Well, Roy, you made a statement too that I wanted to visit uh, before we came on the show, which is AI, artificial intelligence, is not going to be able to fix conventional controls. Uh, expand on that if you would. Yeah. Okay. So today's te technology. Let's let's sort of bake it through the the this, the years, right? So. We started, in fact, these sort of big players in the industry really all started out of the mercury switch thermostat days of the 1800s. And then we came yeah, up with yeah, P. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's from the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and largely, you know, here's the thing that people outside of our industry, when you tell them about what is the underlying technology, they're a little shocked, right? We're still largely using 1800s technology. We spice it up with a little 1930s technology, things like PID and, and, and simple algorithms. But when you look at the challenge we have, where we have these foundation, this platform, that itself fundamentally knows nothing about buildings, right? It's nothing but a collection of sequences and set points and some PID. Uh, you can't, with AI, do what we would call introspect. You can't look into that black box and say, what's in this building? How do I interact with it? What's the importance of these different things in, in the control scheme. How do they relate to each other? How are they interconnected? How do they match the physical reality on the ground? And so long as you can't do that, you doesn't matter how much intelligence, whether it's AI or a whole team of engineers, it's blind to the reality of the building. And so there's very little you're going to accomplish by trying to throw AI on top of what we'd call a black box type control system. So you need to start thinking about, well, how would I make this system know about buildings? How could it understand what buildings are, how buildings work, and how the systems work? Very, very good. Well, cool. that's remarkable, you know, because we, we have, uh, we have uh, made uh, attempts with that idea of throwing AI on top of it, you know, and then, uh, you know, just basically getting the, you know, reading all the inputs, all, all the communications on the network, you know, and whatever, and it's, it's, abracadabra and they can start making uh, you know diagnostics and you know fault detection possible through the 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 metabolism the metabolic rate of the building you know you know things turning off and on and wheezing and, and uh you know calling for heating and cooling at the same time and at the end of some certain period of time get a punch list of what's what's working and what's not you know so i, I think what i hear you saying is that's really not going to work it's, i mean it may work or you might get lucky but that's not the real answer yeah, you're, you're sort of spinning the wheel and hoping. Um, and so we started thinking, you know, okay, what are autonomous buildings? What, what does this mean? What is required? And so what's required to get to that endpoint, to that future place that we need to be is buildings need to be fully autonomous. That means in real time, make their own control decisions, not be strapped down to some sequences that somebody thought five years ago were a good idea for all time. And we can talk about why that's fundamentally an impossible solution. They need to be able to add the systems level intelligence, this organizing intelligence to all the things in the building, right? So when you have four zones next to each other, they can't really be independently controlled like we're doing today. They are in fact thermodynamically connected and yet our control systems know nothing about that. They need to be what we call self-federating, which is you put them in buildings and they know the equipment in the building, the systems, the sensors, and be able to organize that together and themselves as controllers Troy, what was that, connect what was that, up with one another. Troy, what was that term, self what? Self-federating. So it means that, you know, in passive logic, if you connect one or 10 or 100 of our controllers together, they go find each other and they say, hey guys, I see you, let's work together and let's vote for a leader and that leader can lead the system and if somebody comes along with a big baseball bat and hits that leader, um, then they all say, hey, the leader's gone, number one's gone, hey, number 23, how about you be the leader, right? So this self-federation is important for how do we make automation scalable so it works at 1,000 square foot buildings as well as million square foot buildings. Uh, the control. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. 
Uh, well, I was going to ask how edge, you know, edge is a relatively new concept in our industry versus, you know, cloud. How does, how does that fit, feed into the whole self-federating um, control scheme? Right. So, so edge is super important. Um, you can't fundamentally make autonomous buildings. It's right in the name autonomous um, run off the cloud. And here's the problem, you know, that just that first fully autonomous, it needs to make control decisions in real time. That invalidates being able to do this from the cloud. Even the most connected buildings, as you guys all know, have outages on the connectivity. So if it's getting all its control decisions from the cloud, well, what happens when it doesn't have that connectivity? And most buildings don't have the connectivity at all. And then in the middle, the buildings that are connected, you know, the connectivity is not as well good as we want. And even in the deepest part of Silicon Valley, you just have these windows of time when you just don't have connectivity. So resiliency in buildings is important. It needs to be at the edge. The second thing is it needs to be real time. So let's take this to the car world where they have a lot more speed requirements than we do, but we still have speed requirements that if a Tesla autopilot was driven by the cloud at the speed of light, getting back to the cloud and back to the car, that car is driven 40 miles and hit a crowd of people. You hmm. can't do it from the cloud. Hmm. So one of the things about the edge is you need these things. You need resiliency, you need speed, the ability to do real time. You need the ability to organize what's happening in the building and you can only see that if you're in the building. And the edge is really interesting because we're actually, this is our second wave to the edge. So back in the 70s and 60s, it was all about mainframe. That was the cloud, right? And then we moved to the edge in the 80s and 90s with the personal computer. The internet came about and we said, wow, well, we could just shove a bunch of personal computers in a big warehouse and we went, swung back to the cloud because that was a little bit more cost effective. But what's happening now is this phone has the same performance and power as the server sitting in Amazon's cloud. Mm -hmm. And it's coming nearly for free. Right? And that combined with the needs of AI, needing to do these things on site in real time is what's driving this new edge technology. Very, very cool. Well, I want to shift gears a little bit because contrary to popular belief, a digital twin is not what Kenny and I are. People accuse us of being digital twins. <laughs> but, uh, but it seems like so much of your technology is, is sort of revolves around this digital twin concept. So for our community, would you explain your definition of digital twin and how you guys have incorporated it into your, uh, your structure? Right. So if we're going to make fully autonomous buildings, we have to start with the notion that the control system needs to know buildings and needs to know buildings and systems and how they work. And to do that, we took the notion of a digital twin, which many of the people listening may have heard a little bit about. Now, usually when you're hearing digital twin, it's kind of a it's slightly evolved concept of CAD or BIM where you're saying, well, okay, this, here's this de device or object in, in real space and here's its CAD model. But what we mean is this deep digital twin that understands its underlying physics. And to do the, this, this kind of control technology, we need a couple of things to happen. First, we need that the building of the automation system understands the underlying physics of what's going on in the building, because that's the fundamental, right? That's the fundamental thing that decides how we control anything, how we decide anything in a building is the physics of those objects. And the second thing, and it's really important to the notion of control, is we're being asked to control all kinds of buildings and all kinds of systems. And we need this ability to ad hoc design a system made of whatever components and equipment, and it can figure out together how to control that topology. Very cool. Do you have a, a, a visual you could show us on this, Manny? Yeah, let, let's, let's go through a couple of uh, visuals on this because I think it will provide people with a little bit more context of what we're talking about. But very great definition. I love, man, Kenny, I don't know about you, man. I'm getting so much out of uh, Roy. Well, I, can, I think we're seeing another point. pivot point. Uh, uh, Troy, we always give ourselves uh, credit for finding uh, and seeking out the people that are going to change the industry. And that's what Control Trends is all about, you know, finding the trends and, and the trendsetters and the trend, trending and innovation and technology. I think we just come into a, uh, another realization. There's something really hot and heavy here. It's going to make an impact on our industry quickly. Right. And hey, real quick. Now, I see Roy. Kenny's saying Troy. Is it Roy or Troy? Yeah, it, it's Troy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, my apologies. Uh, all right, yep. got you. Okay. All right, you're you're good. We're back up. I grew up, with, uh, I grew up with two brothers that all start with T, and it, it all gets mixed up. So. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> 
All right, Troy, well, this is a cool, looks like you're bringing some good stuff up here. So let's, let's rock and roll with what we have. On yeah, the so let's just talk about what digital twins are. So digital twins enable what we call model-based control. So when we look at how control's been done the last hundred years, right, it's all model-free. There's nothing in a thermostat or a PID controller or, a, or a, your, your control platform that knows anything about the system it's controlling. And we think the next hundred years, not just in buildings, but in all these different industries, is really gonna be about model-based control, where the control system understands the model of the system it's working on. So what's really exciting about Digital Twins is today we have this growing stack of integration that we're doing today. And it's kind of interesting that in our industry, we call it integration, not installation. And it goes to where the work is. All of this effort of just, you know, plugging things and bolting things on. And we're gonna be able to replace all of this with the drawings you probably already have, or if you don't have them, they're really easy to make. And likely you're drawing them yourself just to make the paper to tell the guys in the field what they're doing. So let's look at how this works in terms of digital twin. So a digital twin is a copy of the real world. So here's a pump. A digital twin is a virtual version of that pump. And it starts with this thing called an ontology. So this is somewhat of a nerdy term, um, but I'm going to uh, you know, define it basically as technological existentialism. How does a pump know what it is in the universe? You know, who am I? What do I do? You know, this, it, it's thinking about how does it work in the universe? And, and that's made up of a bunch of components. So first is like, what is my taxonomy, right? I'm kind of transport, a pump moves water from one place to another the way a conveyor belt moves boxes or a fan moves air. So that gives me some identity and global behavior. A pump knows where it is in its ontology in the system, how it's connected to everything, that it's connected to a pipe and that pipe's connected to the boiler and the physics of all of those. It understands its location and its spatial relationships to everything. And it understands that underlying physics. You know, what do I do? It can simulate its own futures. Now what's important about the simulating its own future, and we'll get into that, is this notion of future forward control. But it also allows me to introspect. Intr introspect means I can look into all these variables in the pump and know things about that pump, even without somebody having to set up analytics or even without sensor information that is direct, right? If certain items in the system are working in a certain way, well, I can infer certain variables that I don't even have a sensor for, which is really cool. And all that gets collected up into this sort of organizational physics of, that I can query. So it's not just how do I simulate my futures, but in, in, in reverse, I can look into aspects of how that pump behaves. And finally, what I think is really exciting, you mentioned this, is if you have this ontology, and we can talk a little bit more about the ontology, then you understand the fundamentals of what a pump does, that I give a pump power and that causes the rotor to spin and that creates pressure and that creates flow. And that, inter that sort of global knowledge or meta knowledge allows you to more easily translate into different protocol semantics, right? Because I can speak pump now more easily to BACnet or Modbus or LAN or whatnot. But all these things, while it's kind of sophisticated, get packaged up into this little container that just looks like a CAD symbol and represents the kind of you know, visualization, that one-to-one -one that we're used to in industry, right? A pump represents a pump. A zone represents a zone. And I don't have this mismatch of trying to make a zone represent a PID controller. And once you connect them all together, they can now form whole systems that compute what that system behaves as. And then once it's in your building, well, you have the advantage of all of the sensors telling you how it's operating. So you can automatically regress to make sure they are matching the way the building actually behaves. And then finally, at any point of the operation, you can open up that, that device and go introspect and create analytics all automatically without effort, without you know, additional programming effort. And we can package this all together in a self, forming the self-validating package. So we've actually got an investment from the Department of Energy to build this transferable digital twin standard that we all can share from architects to engineers to automation guys to the guys who are maintaining and managing our buildings to the utilities who want to do this sort of real-time network. So we see this workflow, whether we're doing it in our industry of, now I can create what the system looks like, or I can get it from the architect or engineer. 
And now I'm getting digital worksite guarantees and the system can commission itself. And we know that it's operating in a certain way against that design because it's all one-to-one. -one. It's representing the objects we actually use. And then at the end of the day, the opportunity is working with utilities, we now can do things that were not very possible before because we can start working in real time between buildings and utilities where the utilities can negotiate with the buildings and say, hey, buildings, you know, over the next 12 hours, what are your loads going to be? The, the, uh, the utility can aggregate that information and say, well, I'm going to buy power on the wholesale market that represents what my loads will be over time. And in reverse can say, hey, there's a rate peak coming at three o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, buildings, how about you go navigate around that hours ahead of time and I'll give you some discount. But what we see that's more powerful than this is that now you've got that platform to start going to the future of peer-to-peer -peer energy networks, just like the internet works. That's not the central utility in all the customers. We can start working together in a more uh, demand response, peer-to-peer -peer way. Oh, geez. Uh, Kenny, I'm, I'm almost speechless, but it seems like one of the ramifications of this, uh, Troy, is that uh, your system then requires somebody setting PID loops up to, to commission the, the, the system. Is that accurate yeah that's accurate so it's important to understand when i show you say the software that we're what we're not generating is conventional control uh, and there's a reason for this um we think that this these conventional control ideas like pid loops are actually causing a lot of the pain let's think about the pid loop for a moment a simple simple case where we have a rectangular or single zone building and we have one VAV for that rectangular space. So it's as simple as it can be. Now, as a building physics modeler, having looked at even a simple single zone building, I know that the function, a PID system is basically a function of inside and outside temperature to how do I adjust the damper. But the function of that building is incredibly complex. It has all of these assemblies, insulation and brick and inside drywall and all sorts of walls and windows with, with radiant light coming through from the sun and the roof and the, and, and the ground coupled to the earth. And when I modeled that, I couldn't accurately model that with 100 PIDs, right? PID is kind of a simple curve with this you know, time variance uh, function kind of hack on top. And if you've ever in Excel brought in a bunch of data and 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 take an overly simplistic um, regression algorithm like uh, you know polynomial to your data and you'll know that it goes woo and just like takes off and goes crazy and you're like that doesn't model my my, my data well that's the what PID we're trying to jam this really complex model of zone into this very simple curve so you know the the PID effectively is taking this incredibly complex model of the zone's physical behavior with the occupancy, the weather, and all of its constructions and trying to jam it into a simple curve. And that's fundamentally not possible. And as everybody who knows about tuning PIDs, it's also a little bit unstable. And so getting them tuned well is really hard. And fundamentally, you know, maybe we could say impossible because it's just too simple of a regression of a zone. And as you build out more and more zones that are all interacting with each other, well, it just explodes in complexity. And so we're, we're dealing with a problem right now where our controls technology are such a poor match to what we're trying to regress or what we're trying to, to control. Well, well, well. You know, I, uh, again, I'm, I'm with Eric too. I'm kind of spellbound here because of the, um, you know, it looks like we're at cross purposes in many instances of our industry right now. It's good to get this enlightenment because number one, we're having trouble getting the, the talent and it's because of, of, of our profile and, and our style. Uh, two is that, you know, we're trying to, to react all the time. Like you said, that cycle, that cycle of failure where you're doing the uh, complaint uh, tweak and, and then, uh, and then tune and then complaint tweak and tune. And that pretty well describes a lot of our, our world, but the, the, Execution or the getting the technology uh, into play into our world is also a very good challenge because you have a bunch of barriers. You have a lot of, as you called them, the senior citizens in our industry have have very strong holds on the channels of of, of you know to the contractors through the distributors and to the uh, OEMs and to the business uh, building owners. You know, so so what we're seeing is the internet was the great freer. You know, it, it emancipated all this information. And you don't have to ask for permission anymore, but 
I think the big question here is how, how does passive logic see itself going to market now in another year and then in the, in the future to come? Is it going to be, uh, what well, just tell us about that. What's your yeah. thoughts on that? So one of the things that we see in the marketplace is there's these players at multiple levels. So you've got the, the installer level and you've got the master integrator level and you have the wholesale distribution level. And then we have all of these different uh, people throughout the building chain who are, are really uh, sort of driving some of the thinking, whether it's engineers or architects or the maintenance and management uh, about what solutions go into buildings. But what we saw is, What's interesting about buildings is this interesting inverted value chain. Now, this is really different from other markets. So when we say there's an inverted value chain, what it means is that while there's a lot of billion dollars at the top, right? You might have big REITs or big corporations. That money usually trickles down from, okay, the owner calls an architect, who calls an engineer, who calls a general contractor, who calls a subcontractor, who goes to the distribution house and negotiates for what he's gonna buy about across the counter. And then the guy in a truck is the one who's the fundamental customer. Well, here's, here's what's the disconnect we see in new technology is usually the new technology is trying to sell to the top of the market. Well, those guys don't buy product, right? The guy who's actually installing it in a building is the one deciding about products. So we recognize early in passive logic, while this is pretty disruptive technology, how can we use the technology to address the pain points of the installer? Because they're the ones often making the decision, especially in the design build market, which is fundamentally way bigger than the planned spec market in terms of number of commercial building units out there. So we think that there's an opportunity here to use technology to not only align the reality of the new world where people are buying stuff online together with the importance of the territorial distribution system. And so our go to market is largely through territorial distributor distribution, um, territorial distribution, uh, the, the master integrators, and then bringing into the fold, these HVAC installers and HVAC technicians who can now start bubbling up from the bottom of the market and replacing their thermostatics that they're using today with real passive logic controls. Well, yeah, let's talk about your products. What, what, you know, we, we've talked about the technology, but what are the actual products? Yeah, so our core product is our control unit. And you know, maybe it'd be good before we jump in to the, the hardware and, and taking a look. Let's, let's bring up another uh, visual here. Okay, so fundamentally, what is Passive Logic? So, what we see Passive Logic is as a software platform that's built on this digital twin workflow that takes us from the whole design, build, operate, maintain, manage life cycle of how we interact with buildings. Then we're talking about these solutions for the whole value chain. But again, we see the installer as the fundamental customer in buildings. And so we've wrapped this all up into this control system that we've used this new way of thinking about how do we do automation to rethink, well, how do we make hardware? How do we make product that exposes that new way of thinking to the automation installer? So what Passive Logic's platform looks like, we're taking that digital twin deep integration, it's all put right into the control system. And this platform, is what we think of as integrating this whole slew of things where we're deeply integrating, just like you know, your iPhone again, that, that uh, example. Why did the smartphone market in four years replace the sales of the home computer market of 40 years in terms of units sold? Well, it's because of integration, right? And we can now enable that integration because the digital twins give us a level of knowledge that we can put all this into one package together with what you know, represents 2019 electronics. And so what we see with our passive logic control system is we've got built-in networking that doesn't need any external devices, built-in analytics, built-in VPN. Every box in our system is effectively the head of the system. Uh, you have built-in portfolio management, smart IO, and issue tracking. And what we think is more interesting beyond just the integration of existing concepts is these new technologies that just weren't possible before. So control autopilot, universal protocol translation, automated point mapping, automated commissioning, true human physiology-based comfort control, and this demand response with utilities. So I'll, I'll uh, switch here to our 
our um, visuals, and I'll just actually sort of pick up our control platform. So what's interesting about what we realized with the control platform is we put a screen right on it because we knew that we could do that guided installation. And what we saw early on is this is where uh, all these automation projects were falling down. Like the lowest paid guy in the field would switch two wires and screw it up for a day, a week, a month, and, and, and nobody would know what's going on. So we made it so that the, the screen actually just slid right up and gave you a what you see is what you get view of your points. Nice. And that you have modular points, right? So that you can decide what points and how many points. And you can just put it up to eight modules that gives you 48 points in one box. And this box has all the intelligence on board. So all the intelligence is back here. All of your connectivity, your ethernet, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, everything built on board. And you just supply it with 120 power. And it's going to generate all of its power internally and distribute it throughout the box. So it's better to think of this not so much as a controller, but a whole panel. Because hmm. we're generating that 24 volt AC right on board that you know, 50 VA that's usually that big giant transformer. We have an electronic inverter that does that same thing in about a square inch of space. And then when you put these modules inside, well, they're just distributing all that power. They're distributing whether it's high voltage, low voltage, all the control uh, communication right to these smart modules that each module, each point is again providing built-in line testing, built-in um, power monitoring for every point so that when you hook up a pump or hook up a thermistor or hook up some kind of uh, uh, sensor, well, we go and test that line and say, well, is that what it looks like? Is it really that thermistor in the field or is it actually an RTV or was the line crossed uh, you know, short circuited or open circuit. And, and we do that real time testing and give you live feedback right here. So a uh, question, and it's cause that's extraordinary. It's uh, remarkable. It's compact. The idea of putting the, uh, the, you know, the face, the, the, the troubleshooting panel onto the actual controller is just far out. And, and again, cause this is going to help our industry step forward across all those chasms, all the, the, the barriers of entry are being eliminated. Uh, until we start talking about the engineering tool. I, you know, so we talk about input and output, and then we put it all together. So that's, that's what I'm holding my breath for now. Yeah, so, well, so what's one other aspect of this that is, is worth ma mentioning is once we put the screen on it, we realized that we could do some new things with controls. Because today, what we were finding, we were home running all this wiring back to a back closet in the basement, and it was a lot of work. And once we put the screen on it, we said, well, gosh, this is not just the engineering tool and the, the guidance for installation, but we can now make it a user access point. And so we make it so it flanges into a wall. And so you have the ability, instead of surface mounting this in your mechanical room, flange it into any drywall wall and now putting your automation controls wherever they're convenient for picking up sensors, picking up controllables, and then leaving it in place at user access point. So we found that that was reducing our wiring by about 2x. And so that, that's sort of a neat benefit of like, okay, how do we make both the user, the, the installer, and the control technology all come together? The reduction of uh, wiring by 2x. Also, you're also that, that user access point has always been a nightmare because we always had to have display modules everywhere. Right. And then, and then the final questions are, that are, I'm curious about is with the sensors and everything. Um, I was two times this week I've been out with a major player and going into uh, uh, potential customers and we're selling, you know, technology. And, uh, and then, so if I looked at that, that submission of technology and this one here, I'm, I'm concerned uh, a little bit because this thing seems to be much more advanced, but how is it uh, to, we're seeing a, a desire for IP networks, uh, IP controllers, IOT devices versus the MSTP. That's, I, I mean, it's, I, you talk about things going away quickly. That's one of the ones that's fastest one I, I can see where there's been a preference for IP controllers versus whatever. Yeah. We, we have our issues with cybersecurity where we're, we're trying to, uh, you know, there's two ways really to, to generalize uh, how to do it. Either get on the enterprise network or you have your own building system network, but we're seeing people shifting to a building systems network. So I'd be curious what your thoughts are on, on, on that, that issue. And then finally, the, uh, the, the sensor consolidation. Uh, we saw a presentation where one sensor had eight different sensors in it, and it was in the ceiling mount. So it provided right. everything from thermal uh, imaging, you know, occupancy, uh, you know, pressure temperature, you know, just the whole thing, humidity, I mean, all in CO2. Yeah. I mean, and so we're seeing this 
our, our architecture, the things we used to sell are being reduced into very incredibly sophisticated components. So the big question was, if, if you lose one, do you lose them all? And, and what if somebody, you know, so yeah. at least you had this distribution. It seemed like you have this additional life, like, you know, and then finally was if, if you're, and I don't think you have that problem, but the questions that intelligent users are finding out is how, if we lose the cloud, if we lose the network, where are we at? Do we have standalone operations that are going to make dang sure uh, we're going to maintain this hospital or this intensive care unit or, you know, those sort of things. Right. So I think there's a few things there. So one on, on the privacy. So one of the things that we really focus on is this system, you, you daisy chain, you make, uh, you know, whatever spanning tree or ring networks, you don't need any external equipment. It will just work on its own and it doesn't have to, you know, be part of an existing network. And then you can branch out to the outside world, however you want from one of the, the controllers. So by nature, we're private. By nature, like we said, we're edge-based, right? So we're not dealing with all this information shuttling back and forth between us and the cloud, though we do have a cloud that provides you whole portfolio management. But we think that that privacy and that security is a, a really key part of how we go forward. If you don't have the ability to do wired infrastructure, the system will actually Wi-Fi mesh on its own, again, without any other routers or, or uh, network equipment. Uh, when we get down to the control points, you know, you're talking about these different kinds of systems. Well, we think the legacy is just not going away. And yet there's this proliferation of new different protocols, right? And, and so in our market, in the commercial market, we have some luck that there's a lot of consolidation around things like BACnet. But we're being asked to integrate more and more IoT, which is going to bring in other protocols. And those protocols just keep on compounding. And we can talk a little bit right after this on, on that topic, because I think it's useful to understand the difference between these different protocol stacks. But each one of these modules, they're smart on their own. So every point could be MSTP, could be zero to 10 volts in or out, could be current in or out, it could be 24 volts AC out, it auto switches its power. You can talk a variety of different protocols. So we've made these things super universal and you can have them right in the control system or you can, what we call free range modules, put them in a little controller that daisy chains off or can be wireless. So we have this both a Bluetooth and a, and a Wi-Fi mesh where these guys Bluetooth mesh from that same device. Um, Troy, we got to stop you dude because our industry, I, I, there are too many people that are out there crying right now. Uh, you know, we've, we've been going an hour. It's fantastic. Is it possible? I'm, I'll give you a chance to sort of wrap up and summarize. Yeah. Uh, you just have to make it real quick. Where's the antenna for that mesh and stuff? It, it can't be internal to it. You have to have some ugly antenna hanging there, don't you? It, it's internal to it. And, you know, no we, way. It's you ridiculous. know, like little sensors internal to it. So they, uh, they, they all work together. Wow. Wow. Well, listen, um, um, yeah, I, will, I want to give you a chance, but my question is, can we get you to come back on? Uh, I know you're busy, but we'd love yeah. to maybe, maybe come back on in two, three weeks, four weeks, whatever. And, uh, and I think it just deserves, you got, I know you got a lot more. Yeah. We're just sort of getting Absolutely. to the iceberg here, but uh, anything, any final things you sort of want to wrap up with? And then the last question. You know, I, I think the, what will be ex exciting for maybe in the future is, is uh, take people how this works on the ground, take them through the, the software pop pipeline of how this changes, not only how we automate, but our workflow of automation, which we think really simplifies it for the guys uh, who are doing the business of automation. Um, but what, you know, the takeaway should really be is there's new technologies. They do feel like a step function to the guys on the ground when we're like saying, you know, ta-da, but we want to make sure that people know that this is a magic box. That step function was the result of years of hard work of a lot of people taking what is possible with current technology and inventing some things special for our market due to the unique opportunities that we have in the building space. Very, very cool. I'm assuming passive-logic.com uh, is the best website for people to connect? It is. All right, brother. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, Troy. Kenny Smyers, what did you think? Well, I tell you what, I had to, I had to, you know, I, I, I was so impressed. What, what an amazing concept, what an amazing uh, intelligent person that really 
understands our industry as well as we do and brings more technology into it. And again, you know, we could be at cross purposes uh, unintentionally, of course, uh, for a lot of the reasons we might be our own worst enemy of bringing new people in, into our, our, our world because of like, again, we don't have uh, that dissonance, the cognitive dissonance. I'm going to have to read up and study more about that. But the impression you make on young people when they come into a factory or they come into a vendor or you know, these facilities are not the same as our, our versions of what we see and what we think is, you know, cool, clever, smart, or whatever could be off, could be skewed considerably to tr attract the, the most intelligent people that are available. But I thought one thing in particular was that thing with that app coming to work with the initiative to create a, a new application that you could give high fives on versus, you know, keeping a quiet day because everybody's been crying, complaining and moaning about this didn't get done or having issues with integration, whatever. That, that concept, the mentality for a young person is just not going to work. Yeah. Yeah, no, I got you. I got you. So for all our uh, younger folks in the industry out there, Kenny, I'm giving you a, a digital high five right now. Great job. Keep up the good work. And buddy, anything else before we hop off, man? We got uh, the nomination ballot should be coming out the first week in October, which is mm -hmm. coming up uh, for the Control Trends Awards. Uh, there's still a few sponsorships left. I think all the platinums are gone, but I think we have some golds and silvers and maybe a, maybe a bronze left. So, uh, uh, But that's filling up. So we should be sold out here in the next, um, I'd say, two weeks. For sure. Uh, thank you very much for all, all the sponsors that, uh, man, I just, uh, they, you know, they're all just uh, great, uh, you know, proponents. They, they get behind control trends because of what, what I think some of the things we're doing, but this event is going to be just a, a great episode. Again, it's going to be a great uh, summary of our, our 2019. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, you know, uh, who's who the industry is going to be there all right well kenny there you go man that's another week on control talk now you're smart brother video cast and podcast a special special thanks to our guest this week troy harvey from passive logic good stuff there and uh you know so we're that remember be bold stay in control high five a younger person because troy says that's what makes them tip. Oh, yeah. okay, and see you next week on control talk now indeed eric indeed kenny smyers football if there's a group that I can follow, that's exactly right for right for Exactly right for right for Sometimes when I try to reason, you don't seem to listen at all. I don't know if it's just a feeling. Or if we are about to fall yeah, I'm going cool. back